Johnny Ball are on. Welcome back. Why did your missus say not to wear a baseball cap on the podcast? Well, <laughs> because obviously it disguises my good looks, doesn't it? And um, I'd like to mirror you anyway, mate. If you've got a baseball cap on, I'm in for the baseball cap. If I was wearing my Eat Vegan baseball cap, would you mirror me then? Oh, I'd probably have one saying Eat Gingers. <laughs> I can say that I am a parent of a ginger child, so <laughs> you get license, obviously. Yeah, mate. How's uh, how's your uh, how's your week been? <laughs> I've been pretty fragged. Yeah, I, as you can see, I, I look like a shriveled testicle at the moment, and owing to lots of things, uh, obviously work, normal jogging, being a parent of a very adventurous seventeen-month-old little girl. But on a serious note, the current situation in Afghanistan has occupied us all, hasn't it? Yeah, you, me, our muckers, your regiment in particular. Um, people from my own cat badge, I know, have, have just returned uh, from the ground. Uh, but with that are all the associated people and networks that we know and have worked with over the years that is definitely reaching in to us via WhatsApp. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm okay, but it's been it's been pretty exhausting if I, if I'm perfectly honest. And there's I think this is just the start. Uh, in what way? In fact, y yeah, I I said something about a week. ago. was it a week ago? I can't remember. I can't remember if it was on this or not. Uh, but I alluded to the possibility that. Taliban could very well be turning a fresh leaf over, and that was like a week ago. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think they are, but they could very well be. You, you just don't know. I mean, they're certainly not the same Taliban as they were twenty years ago. You cannot argue with that. No, I think they're playing a blinder at the minute, an absolute blinder. Um, in what they're doing, how they're going about things, their their media ops are flipping incredible. Like again, you compare this to twenty years ago. Compared to two years ago, a year ago, unbelievable. Did you see that they that that U.S. drone strike went in, and that on the ISIS K tar target, alleged target, whatever, and the Taliban turned around and said that they welcomed the the strike. Did you see that? Yeah. They that I mean, that is awesome marketing. <laughs> it is. It is. They obviously don't mean it. They, they, they are just, they are playing everybody off at the moment and they're doing it incredibly well. <clears throat> there is no way on earth they are doing that on their own. There is no way on earth. I have this inkling that over the last five, maybe three, five years, that we, we all know that different organizations get trained up in different countries, different areas for whatever. You know, we know that the countries neighbouring, some of the countries neighbouring Afghanistan, they play a big part in training, uh, training up Taliban fighters and other terrorist organisations in, in the area. I reckon over the last few years, as the troop withdrawals have withdrawn, uh, have, have dwindled down in Afghan, and our intelligence capability on the ground has gotten much less than what was before, so much much more stuff can go on without us knowing as being coalition forces that much there has been a massive drive on preparing the Taliban for the events of the last two weeks. Now when those troops go is they sweep through. They sweep through and their marketing's on point. Their p politics is on point. Their governance is on point. Their, their, their um, offensive capability is on point. You know, I'll go back. They, they are, this, these are not the same beasts as they were several years ago, 20 years ago. I'd agree with the majority of that, um, and you know, like the AK-47, the one of the most proliferated items of kit is an iPhone. So, no doubt that they have sought inspiration from Daesh as well. So they have changed, probably for the worse. So we've now seen, um, for example, copycat activities such as uh, taking of brides, which was never really a TTP that um, was that common um during certainly during our area era so i think they've actually been inspired for the worst by daesh operations and they're going to try and out daesh out you know daesh itself so i think that's one thing that we're starting to see evidence of the other thing as well is that um yeah essentially they've got their own 77 brigade and and we've kind of been a bit busy in other info ops and activities 
they have um and inf- and this is not something that the Taliban that you and I probably were more familiar with during uh, the the Herrick era and certainly in some of the areas of operations such as you know um in Helmand and Lashkar and all those places that will be familiar for our generation these are likely to be out of area um operators so the Haqqani network is is back in town um and other elements from outside so they're not the ten dollar a day taliban um farmers you know one minute taliban the next um, because their ability and proliferation of these devices we saw that they all had mobile phones but by and large you know, charging them off of solar panels it's still a limited infrastructure within those very rural environments in the same way in our country, you know, you can't get a signal, can you? So, but I do think that the expertise, they have played a very strong info op. Um, and that's probably something that we, the British public, weren't necessarily attuned to. Uh, and I do think that they have, they haven't changed. They've probably been inspired even more and they're probably uh, likely to be even more horrific going forward, which I'm sorry to say. Will you do me a favor and just pull that mic down a bit? You are booming through. Booming. There you go. Talk to me, Goose. One, two. There two. we go. It's there better. we go. Yeah, you're booming through. Um, <coughs> um, uh, how do we know the Haqqani network's back in there? How do we know these? How are we, do we know this mostly out of area fighters? Well, the Haqqani network are an imported part of the Taliban from Pakistan. And um, they. Uh, have been shown evidence on the ground in Afghanistan um, in terms of the what, the images, that info, what that you've seen. Um, it's highly likely that that famous picture that the, of the American kit simulating the American flag picture, that was um, the more sophisticated end of the Taliban, which is the out-of-area Haqqani. Um, I've not network. seen that. I, yeah, they mocked the Americans. The, um, the, uh, is it the Korean War? Um, Memorial. They mock that by dressing up in American kit and equipment and ha- hoisting a, uh, um, a the white um, Taliban uh, flag. So yeah, that's that's how sophisticated. Again, goes back to that info op point. Um, so and the other out of area element that we have, of course, is the um, ISIS K, which covers the whole region, not just Afghanistan but Pakistan, um, uh, Iran. Um, as well so the the south asian area essentially common mistakes that people make when talking about the region they refer to it as the middle east which it isn't of course it's central and south asia that we're focusing on um with regards to afghanistan so they uh, it's a lot of this will unfold um but it, it, i'm sorry to say i understand why governments are having to use a slightly different narrative and rhetoric in order to engage with the the Taliban because they're trying to be pragmatists. They're trying to get more people out, I guess, quite crudely. But it's it's very difficult for us that have served in that country and gave the best years of our lives and and in other cases our friends their actual lives to to hear that. I get that. I found that very difficult. Um, and the almost political naivety that the Taliban have changed. I don't think is a particularly helpful narrative for UK PLC to be hearing if they want to use that in terms of trying to negotiate with the Taliban um, then fine it's their bag but for us to hear that uh, I don't think that's particularly helpful I think that I think that one of the main reasons that's being done though in this that the Taliban has changed well Taliban has changed right but I think that narrative they're, they're playing especially America especially elements here in the UK and the government in that they changed, they're saying they've changed for the better in a way, aren't they? And they certainly were, what, four or five days ago when they were, when they were talking about women's rights aren't going to be as bad as it as they were in all this stuff. But I think that that narrative, it plays well into gov- UK's ha- UK government's hands, US government's hands, policymakers' hands, because then the insinuation is that, oh, we we haven't lost anything. Oh, it's this less bad, isn't this it? This isn't a failure. Yeah. Actually, this is good. It, I think that's why it 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 dampens down the 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 appearance of this catastrophe is what it looks like. Yeah. You know, it dampens it down and makes the backlash less severe. That's the way they see it. I think. Well, unfortunately, many of us that um, 
So there's, there has been this operation amongst many of our networks to stay in touch with those in Afghanistan and and get some of those people out. And there's been a number of success stories. Um, certainly, I'm not being alone in that. And there are people quite prolific on Twitter, higher profile than, than perhaps we have, um, who have been very successful uh, with that. I've had my own successes, but to only today I received a WhatsApp message um, via one of our little networks from someone on the ground. This is a family of six, you know, someone that has had served in the, you know, again, I can't reveal too much about this individual for obvious reasons, but someone that served, um, someone whose children's passports I have copies of on my phone. Uh, one of those ch children, similar age to my daughter. And, that really does make it real. And with that, those, as we've been trying to help this individual, has been the ground truth. What's actually happening on the ground? How the Taliban are operating? Um, you know, there was um, one of, there'd been devices that had been compromised in searches by uh, the Taliban on, on the ground. So people that have numbers of other people that have assisted the West. We know about the, the data breach that, you know, we've been so wrapped up here in our own country about things like GDPR and data protection. Well, we've just seen the biggest, most catastrophic flaw in data protect protection that's perhaps ever been seen um, with the um, compromisation, if that's the word, uh, of the... Um, the uh, the devices, um, uh, the the DNA and, and biometric biometric, biometric de devices that those de that you and I have used, um, and that's been compromised. So we know they're going to they're starting to use that. They're starting to go to house to house, and um, there's been a big focus in Kabul, quite rightly, in terms of the airlift in recent times. But in other parts of the country, we're we're hearing reports in Kandahar, for example, them going door to door with lists. We're starting uh, from m the people that I have been connected to messages have been left on the individual's phones to say we know you have been done this we're coming for you so they they got more sophisticated in terms of their targeting operation they've been gifted far more data in order to create those target packs essentially um so they're going to be far more efficient um influenced by daesh and uh, perhaps a even more perverse version of taliban um i'm sorry to say but i'm very pessimistic and very um frightened about about the fate of those individuals and the other thing the other layer is this there's, there's, there's a cultural layer which is about pashtun wali which i'll talk about in a second but they've by working with the west they've just essentially extracted from their country those that are going to perhaps be at most challenging to them as a power so the academics you know those that have served in government those that have served in the um afghan uh, security forces there's been several thousand of those people and their children you only have to look at masood and his son now stood up in the panjshir region leading that northern alliance and um, getting back together again uh, as the uh, credible opposition to uh, the taliban um so if you think that the the extraction of these individuals has actually removed a problem for the Taliban, which is a threat uh, to their, their power. So that might explain one of the reasons why it did go relatively smoothly in terms of the Taliban and the West, that cooperation, and why the actual horrific um, incident came from ISIS-K and not the Taliban itself. That's one offer. But I mentioned the the, um, the cultural. In terms of my assessment about the Taliban, we have to understand that the Taliban are Pashtuns. But not all Pashtuns are Taliban, of course. But the majority race within Afghanistan are the, are the Pashtun culture. Um, most famously, um, you know, President Karzai was a Pashtun. Um, so that represents about 60%, I think, of the, of the overall population of Afghanistan. And with that comes an ancient code of the way they live their life, which is Pashtun Wali, the way of the Pashtun. Now, there are some key tenets to that, which... I, I benefited from, for example, the, and you probably have as you are on the ground, and you get welcomed, don't you? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And these are people that have absolutely nothing, but will give you everything. You know, always get you get the bruise on the chai, sit you down, and try and make you feel welcome wherever you are. And they, you know, and we've seen that the sheer, you know, the the poverty, but they'll still give you that. And that's uh, malmastia, which is um, hospitality. But one bad element of that is padao the tenant of revenge so therefore 
this centuries-old pre-Islam code of life, Pashtun Wali, indicates to me that they're not going to change and all of a sudden, actually, let's revise Pashtun Wali. They're not going to do that. It's in their DNA. You know, they're, they're Pashtuns first before they are Muslims, before they are Afghans, before they're anything else. And therefore, that tenant of revenge makes me really fearful about the future because that revenge will be, if you are a former interpreter, let's just say, and you've extracted yourself from the country but left family members behind, well, unfortunately, that debt gets passed on to that family. So it runs deep. And that understanding is really important for us to know about the longer term implications of, of, yes, we can be humanitarian and we want Afghans to be in safety and be welcome in this country. But those left behind too, we shouldn't lose sight of that. What was the motivation for ISIS-K um, uh, detonating the ID at the, at the airport, do you know? Um, this is all part of this um, power grab. You know, it's 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 in order to uh, send a message to their finances, because we we just assume this Taliban is this you know organised um, pan national organisation. Well, that might not necessarily be true. You know, they've been in the shadows. They um, certainly haven't run a country for for a while, um, and indeed, in in terms of the the wider tribal society, they're ability to actually govern something that over the last 20 years has seen huge advances in the economic growth in terms of schools, colleges, governance, um, elections, and all of that stuff that's happened over the last 20 years. Are the Taliban going to be able to run that? So therefore, it gives an opportunity for an organization like ISIS-K to actually exert some um, influence and authority because they have their finances. Um, let's look a little bit further east. And therefore, they want to put themselves up as a credible opposition. Um, they're not just going to simply let the Taliban, you know, walk in and business as was. So much has changed in the last 20 years. So in terms of that Daesh, ISIS-K um, emerging threat. So guess what? There is a realistic possibility that civil war will intrude as these power brokers will start to, you know, carve up, negotiate, fight, plus we then have the resistance hopes within the Panjshir region, which is predominantly a Tajik resistance and under um, Masood. Um, so it is a highly complex, highly ethnically um, driven with those external factors. And then guess what else has changed since we, you know, 20 years ago? China, a resurgent, you know, here, a rise in China. They have a 50 mile border um, with Afghanistan along the Wakhan Corridor. And between the Wakhan Corridor and Kabul are some nice deposits that they would like in order to you know, f keep their economy going. And they won't have the same values and ideals that we would have, say, to the environment, to people, um, in terms of their own losses, what's acceptable uh, coming up against any opposition, whether it be from ISIS-K or the Taliban. Do you think China will really care? Possibly not. So that's another exterior factor. And of course, we then have um, the uh, the Shia um, um, Ira Iranians. And they will have uh, an interest in the Hazara, uh, Shia, the Shia Hazara. Um, the next, uh, I think 30% of Afghanistan are Hazara, but they are heavily persecuted by, by the Taliban as well. So they'll have an interest too. Um, they will also have an element of control because the breadbasket of Afghanistan, Helmand, the River Helmand, stems from Iran. So they've got some levers as well. And we know that in Afghanistan, how powerful um, the water people that control the water are, the mirabs. Yeah, on a very local level, controlling water is really important. But if you then go to the strategic level, then that stems from Iran um, as well. So they have a big sway over water security. And then what else has changed? We've got another layer, a thing called COVID, right? <laughs> that's that's affecting in huge ways. We don't have the vaccination program that we've enjoyed. Um, and then we've got things like drought as well. And all in that, the, the people in the middle of this, the ordinary Afghans are the people that are going to suffer. Um, which So the, a, a complex tragedy within our happening before our eyes. And the question is, is how are we going to respond in the future? What is going to be the foreign policy of the West? I think the Americans have made themselves pretty clear. 
got the midterms coming up next year. Where I think um, a third of the Senate and um, and uh, the entire House. So he's going to be playing to that audience over the next year. So I don't suspect we'll see a change in policy uh, from from Biden because he'll be focused on that midterm election point. Um, but how else are we going to react? Do you think Biden will be around? Do you think Biden will be around then? Uh, what, <laughs> physically on the planet? <laughs> do you think he'll be the president then still? Um, yes. Did you see him sleep? Did you see the, the video of him sleeping? <sighs> but it, but the, 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 Today, there's fallen yesterday. marines. No, 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 no. I saw the one where he's looking at his watch as the as the in the ramp ceremony, which was pretty. No, no, no. There's one I saw it today, and he's with. Um, I'm assuming it's an Israeli. Might be the Israeli pr- uh, premier. Um, but he's sat there and he's the Israeli's talking. I did see that. And he's yeah. getting his head right down. He's sleeping. In this, uh, he won't be around. But I mean, on, on a different side, oh, I don't want to go on the Biden. I do, do you want to go on a bite but not right now. Uh, yeah. I I don't see we can do anything of any of any uh, real impact in that country. Uh, now, I don't think credibly. I don't think we can. Um if we were I think if we were going to do something of any credibility, we wouldn't have gone through the whole evacuation. We would have been pumping troops in, I think. I think it's too late for that now. Uh, which leaves it to Russia, China, Iran. Oh yeah, forgot about Russia. This sounds like <laughs> the most most depressing um, start to <laughs> one of your uh, podcasts ever. It's important, no, mate. I, you know, I, I, I said it a few times before. I, you know, I'm trying to, I ain't trying to understand the whole situation for my own sake and just to get a decent handle on it. For, yeah, for sanity's sake. Um, and you know, you've got a really good handle on a lot of stuff. You've been a lot more involved with uh, direct comms with people out there over the whole last week, 10 days than, than I have. So it's, it's it really interesting to hear your perspective on things. Well, I have to say that on a positive note, that has shown our community in a, our community, when I say our community, I mean the armed forces community. And I don't just mean in the UK. I've been liaising with some friends in the States who are linked to some pretty influential pe- people. But they're basically our generation um, but politicos that work behind the scenes for different um, American uh, politicians. And they have their own networks as well. So in the last few days, because now we've moved to the second phase, the air, I mean, the, at one stage, as the airhead was shutting and the Americans had shut the gate, I was getting messages, can we get some guys through the Brit one? I was then going to my political contacts to then deliver the bad news back to them. Sorry, guys. At that stage, they had buses of um, civilians in between the Taliban checkpoint and the US checkpoint, and it was, sorry, we're not taking any more. So we were trying to get those buses through. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to, because that situation was move, rapidly moving on. However, that connection of our brothers and sisters in the States is pr- already proving effective. I've got a countless amount of WhatsApp groups um, sharing, trying to grade and challenge some of, because it's so difficult, but I guess in the land of the blind, the one an, one-eyed man is king. Um, but they have supplied and we have supplied back on the ground information from people moving across Afghanistan, talking about where the Taliban are. Again, I won't reveal details of that on this podcast, but you get the sense where we can understand the Taliban's TTPs on the ground. And also we can then send that on to others who might be moving that direction. We can give live as best as possible updates around what borders are open. Um, as well, in order for people on the ground to make their own decisions about what they're going to do with their future. And for us, it actually makes us feel useful. It's been really difficult. Prior to that, we had this royal ground rush of being contacted. I've got such and such. I had this um, British woman in her 40s. A friend of mine knew I was involved in this kind of work um, within the veterans community and said, have you got any contacts? Can you help this woman? And I, again, I'm getting sent copies of a passport, a mobile number, everything via WhatsApp. This digital little ships exercise. I mean, I grew up in Kent inspired by the Second World War. I was obsessed with it as a kid. The Battle of Britain, Dunkirk. Never before did I think there would be a, t- a little tiny little ship, a digital one, in our own Dunkirk evacuation, albeit via WhatsApp. Um, but here we are. And... That as that information came through, I've had some successes and I've had, sad to say, failures. But I was able to use the political network, and um, I'd really like to um, 
thank Alicia Kearns MP, who's the MP for Rutland and Melton, comes from a MOD, Foreign Office background. And I, from the moment we discussed this, um, in, oh, my wife works for her, by the way, that's the connection, not like, you know, go around a garden and all the time but in her garden the other <laughs> week <laughs> an event my wife had organized um the, the conversation we had in that garden was just the start of her genuine s sincere care to help out and to do what she could so i've been firing lots of stuff at alicia and we've had successes and failures she's had some heartbreak in terms of some of the the people she was seconds away of getting through but I don't know how many countless people that her and a number of other MPs and their staff behind the scenes have been doing, um, again, sharing, um, has been phenomenal. So I'd like to thank on this on this episode, Alicia, for everything you do, uh, because she's been an absolute angel. She really has. Shout out to Alicia Kearns. Yeah, one of the good ones. One of the good ones. I on, all politicians are good, aren't they? I thought all were good. <laughs> Well, <laughs> put up a sandbag. I've got an opinion on that. But on a serious note, uh, actually, um, it does give us, give us hope about the kind of leaders that we should that we have and we should have. We shouldn't we shouldn't accept anything less. We've got Alicia, who essentially comes from our community, MOD, defence background. Um, but we saw during that Afghan debate, we saw Dan Jarvis stood up on the, on the floor of the House of Commons, opposite bench Tom Tugendhat, and that amazing piece of oratory those guys serve together um as i've detailed on the veterans in politics podcast just saying um <laughs> plug away mate plug away. <laughs> but when tom came on my show you know he spoke about that and there's a very amusing picture of them with some very dubious haircuts out out on the ground um in theater but these are op political opponents that have actually served together in afghanistan and funny enough, they were two of the best speeches of the day. We then had our good friend Johnny Mercer, of course. And Johnny consistently, you know, has been commenting on this and, and the tragedy and from from a position of, you know, three tours of Afghanistan. So we've seen some really good examples amongst the veterans, of which there are 50 in the House of Commons out of the 650 MPs. I think out of those 50, five or six have done a tour of Afghanistan. And... The value that they brought to that debate and the now, the here and now, Tom is chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. I suggest that's going to be something as they do their inquiry and people like Dominic Raab get hauled before it. It's going to be very interesting watching in the coming weeks and months. So just a little top tip there. Um, but the point being is about our political leaders. What's happened in Afghanistan has been a human failure and humans Polit are, are politicians are humans. So these have been political decisions. They've not been the tactical decisions or dare I say even the operational ones that we were involved in. They've been strategic. So whether you look at Biden's, um, the way in which he's extracted from, from Afghanistan or the way in which our own government, so for example, looking at doing sanctions on what? You know, uh, that, that was our policy immediately. Let's sanction Afghanistan. Well, they've been operating for centuries via the Hawala network, which is an underground network of how they transact. How else do you think they've been able to get drugs, move money around all these years? Um, so sanctions will only hurt Afghan people because that's a traditional way of looking at how to uh, you know, adopt a policy towards Afghanistan going forward. So if we want better people making decisions for us at the top level within Parliament or President of the United States, then I happen to think that the armed forces community is a good place to, to, to get good people. And we've seen the evidence of that in the Afghan debate. But then if you cascade that down even further, we're talking about now, as we go into the next phase of resettlement of Afghans, we're talking about local government. Did you know 30 councils across this country have flat refused to take Afghans? And it's like, okay, just flat refuse. Well, why? And I would argue those key strategic positions in local authorities that are making decisions around adult social care, housing, um, health, etc. Those decision makers need to be better too because it's been a human um, catastrophe at the, at the strategic end, but then as that cascades down into our local communities where these Afghans will be resettling, 
and people that served alongside you and I, unarmed, supporting us, helping save lives, it by and large, and their families. And I've explained the reasons why it's important for their families to be here because of that Pashtun Wali and revenge, etc. Then we're going to need better politicians in local government. And therefore, this is why I'm so passionate about the armed forces community, because the empathy I've seen displayed from our community at the moment towards the Afghans, um, the human emotional intelligence that I've seen in the last couple of weeks has really fired me up about the prospect of veterans and reservists and spouses serving in, lo in politics, whether it be local government right up to the strategic level. And this, this has been a good p thing come out of this horrific mess mm. going back phil phil ingram who's on the podcast recently he's of the opinion that military failure at a strategic level is i, I don't want to i don't want to misrepresent him here um so apologies for not getting this quite right but his opinion is that military failure at a strategic level so campaign failure for example I mean, we, we did that podcast it wasn't long before the situation from afghanistan but you know it was, it was very relevant um, is it the opinion that uh, that failure is due, to e not equally, but uh, in in, in uh, a share share of it is due to politicians, but then a share of it, a large proportion of it, is due to senior military figures, not willing to, not, not he's pretty scathing actually in his words, uh, not willing to yeah. um, uh, tell tell the politicians what, what they need to be told in order to make the right decision, instead telling the politicians what they think they want to hear in order, maybe, to feather one's nest for a life after the military. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, I, I, I listened to the podcast and there wasn't much that I disagreed with. Again, it's human. These are humans. So they're cult these are cultures, humans, making decisions. And when they are, um, for example, in senior ranks, I think we have 350, I might have to fact check this, but 350 brigadier ranks. We certainly haven't got 350 brigades. And these are people doing, uh, one stars and above, doing senior uh, strategic roles within MOD main building and other commands as well. But these are human beings. So they're unelected, of course. But then there are those that, are, we can't influence that. We can demand more for our democracy about reform to our armed forces and participate in that. We just had an integrated review as an example of that. So we can always lobby uh, via our, it, it, anyone can do that via their MP um, or by a more organized campaigns, but we can't influence those generations. Um, we can try and get more better, more diverse people in to Sandhurst, Dartmouth and Cranwell now. So those, those future leaders reflect us better and then hopefully get better decisions. But there's little we can do about that. We can do that through democracy, though. So those people that do become ministers, they've got to be MPs first. And before they become MPs, they've got to be selected as candidates first. So whether you are a member of a local political party that's respond or a trade union or any body that has a say in the election of political candidates... Um, that's something we can all do because you can ha you can be a participant rather than an observer in all of this. And that's step one. Step two, stand up and serve again yourself. If you think these decisions, whether it be a local level, which I'm pr pretty very passionate about, there are 20,000 councillors across the UK, plenty of room for veterans in the armed forces community, or whether it be those that are in the limelight in Parliament as well. If you don't think they're good enough, well, stand up and serve again yourself. If you're going to do that, Give me a shout. I'll give you a bleed me dry for information. I've got some courses coming up as well. Um, come along. Give it a go. And, and that's the way that we can actually affect change. We can't do anything now unless it's multi-generational about the senior officers. And Phil can certainly comment on that better than I can. He's been closer to it. But we can do something about the other bit, which is ultimately the buck stops with the political decision makers and they are elected and don't forget the civil service too, because that's another cohort who are whispering it in the ears of the ministers and, and the politicians, or in the local government, local council officers whispering in the ears of the local politicians. So we need better humans, stronger humans. And I happen to think that we're bloody good for that in the armed forces community. We can actually stand up to people. If you're going to have a, 
a chippy civil servant, <laughs> you know, uh, putting, trying to influence you, or dare I say it, a, you know, a very a senior officer, um, then having someone able to stand up to that look no further than service-driven people. So, to suggest, so what you're suggesting is that um, is that uh, if 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 in hindsight, if there'd been a higher proportion of ex-military in politics, then the outcome right now would not, maybe not be what it is because the for, the policy would have been different. Quite possibly, couldn't have been any worse. Couldn't have been any worse. I think you'll find. I'll put you on the spot, Hugh. Um, <laughs> For my fucking podcast. I know. <laughs> Sorry, mate. But uh, Go on. right, okay. You're an you're an MP. Okay. What what would be your approach to voting for future military intervention in? Let's not pick out Afghanistan. Let's pick another country. Let's put uh, one of the Eastern Bloc countries. Which in, and you know the Russians have gone in, hypothetically speaking. What, and gone to Parliament, there's a vote on intervention, military intervention. Will you be straight away up for that? No. Where do you think that where do you think that comes from in terms of military intervention, perhaps your well, slight another, reticence? Another full picture. Okay. I know everything about it. Yeah. Why, what what what's the benefit to us? What's the problem going on there? What's the history of it? Why is the country invaded? What is the cost to us potentially? What is the outcome? What's the objective? Can the objective be achieved? Do we put enough time towards it? Have we got the resource to put towards it? Is there public support for it? Yada, yada, yada. Okay. Like me, you went to a state school like me, yeah? Uh, like a normal school. Normal school. Yeah. Yeah. Did we go through that when we were at school? No. No? So I would wager that you and I think pretty similarly about military intervention. Where do you think we were schooled about that? <laughs> well, life. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I know what you're saying. You know yeah, I'm going I, I with this. Understand. But you could go and pick out someone else, right? And I could, you could go and pick out someone else from the crowd, yeah. sit next to me, and there we go, get in there, get in nuke there. them all. Yeah, bags of smoke. <laughs> yeah, right flanking, all of that. No, I see your point. I see I see your point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't got any anecdotal, I have, it's only anecdotally speaking, I haven't got any empirical data, but I would argue that those have actually been and seen conflict are slightly more reticent and actually, if you look at the voting record, I think it was during the um, the Libyan intervention, those that had military service were the ones that were actually arguing not to go into Libya in terms of debating and in terms of voting for it as well. Uh, you know, we can pull out some, some of that voting record. And I would argue that that would be uh, quite a few of our cohort would be far more reticent. They might actually make a decision that they, sometimes you do have to go to war, right? Sometimes there is time for that. But in terms of that political dimension, I do think that more veterans are far more uh, would be far more considered, and then on a more local level, far more empathetic in terms of the plight of the refugees because we've seen poverty, we've seen how uh, the worst you can ever see in terms of how people live and the impact, the human cost of conflict. So I think actually it doesn't exactly go with our image, does it? Right. But I think we're a lot more caring um, and a lot more um, humanitarian when they then resettle in our communities. And rather than simply saying, oh, you know, we're full, you know, refugees and all that, I think we'll be far more considered. Um, certainly this is how I feel. And, and this is just from talking to my network of friends and their attitude to resettling Afghans in this country has been far more hum humanitarian than what I've seen with some of my civilian friends. And certainly don't go and look at Facebook in, for opinion about in local communities. So I'm really trying to argue here that we need to be involved in those decision making processes, not just to get the right decisions, but when decisions have been made to be able to then act on those, particularly in local government level, based on that life experience that we've got. Because guess what? You don't need a GCSE or, a or an A-level or a degree to be a politician. Right, no qualifications required. So therefore, life experience has got to come to play there, and too few of them have it. No, I agree with you. And I, I've been a bit flippant there, and I said you can get anyone, and they can flip and nuke. They say nuke it. You know, you're talking about trade craft. If if there's a, the more pe when you're talking about military intervention, for example, then the more people who have military experience who are involved in making that decision, the better. I agree with you completely. Um, what should we have done in Afghanistan? Should we have stayed? If the if the even if the US said right we're pulling out should we have gone 
Uh, we don't think that's a great idea. We haven't achieved the aim. Well, I think the Secretary of State was arguing for, um, Ben Wallace was arguing for us to actually go it alone at some stage um, and lost that argument. But what we should have done, well, I there's, there's many right answers about Afghanistan, but there's one blatant wrong answer. And I know it's hindsight 50, you know, 50 50 and all that, but it's just what's happened. What you don't do, you don't extract during fighting season, for example, when everyone's looking for something to do. There's, there's quite a lot of labour about at the moment during fighting season. They're not farming. Brilliant. Nice one. So you don't do it then. You don't do it slavishly to a significant and important timeline of September the 11th. You, you know, that, that, that was clearly uh, a driver in terms of political symbolism. You don't do it like that. You certainly don't close down Bagram overnight. You don't um, close down Bastion um, you don't then rely on one airhead, um, I think they've got an A-pod, don't they, um, in terms of extracting a single concentrated effort of people infilling into that and also enabling the, the uh, Taliban to then encircle and ISIS-K to then infiltrate as well. Um, so in terms of the, the, you know, the operational approach, that's certainly one way that I wouldn't have done it. I would certainly... Again, not viewed this through the eyes of an interstate solution. It's almost as if we've unlearned everything that we understood about the tribal and ethnic cultures within Afghanistan, because we viewed this as a state on state, oh, Taliban, government, government, round peg, round hole. Uh, and that's been our, our approach, rather than actually looking at the complexities of those remote tribal communities. When I used to speak to Afghans in Helmand, and ask them about you know, their uh, attitudes towards the um, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, you know, they'd look at me blank-faced. They didn't really care. They had, all they cared about was security, having a secure bubble in order for them to live their lives, to be able to farm, to be able to bring up the families, to be able to gossip, to be able to um, have the market going, to be able to actually occupy the compound that had been riddled with IEDs for too many years that's all they really cared about what was right in front of them and their identity was certainly wasn't necessarily afghan it was more about their tribal identity so i think there could have been done more leaning into that dynamic um because certainly that's played to the advantage of the taliban i said earlier that you know the taliban are pashtun but not all pashtun the taliban so that's played into their strength because that's the majority um center of, of eth ethnic mass within Afghanistan and they've recognized that um, so I certainly wouldn't have done it not a traditional state on state solution um, you know we have uh, we, we have the Pashtun race split by a bureaucratic line that we created I think in 1898 or 1896 thereabouts the Durand line that separates Afghanistan from Pakistan that splits an ethnic race you know, when I was taught Pashto by teachers in um, uh, in the, the language school in Beaconsfield, they, these were Pashtuns, um, or more often not from Pakistan or Afghanistan, um, but very much identity around the Pashtun identity. So I think that's something that could have been played out a lot more in terms of the longer term, though, again, it's admitting failure if, if Afghanistan as a state, um, you know, that nation building side of it crumbles. Um, but there's certainly lots of right answers and one catastrophic wrong answer that we're just living through at the moment. Mm. But in militarily speaking, I actually think we could, again, could have had that footprint um, in terms of uh, supplying that, that more sophisticated top cover, uh, whether that be from um, air uh, assistance uh, for, the, for the ground troops to be able to then operate. Um, because that was their morale, not just the fact that in terms of getting them paid as well from central government, but having that support, that air support, um, was, was their operational morale. So I think that could have played out. But then going back to your original point earlier on about info ops, we could have done more there um, by embedding with the Afghans. In fact, um, the precursor to 77 Brigade, um, 15 Psychological Operations Group, won the Wilkinson Sword for Peace. Um, as as it, uh, I think it's changed its name from Wilkinson to another brand. Other brands are available, but um, they won the sword of peace 
for their work around influence. They created radio stations in Afghanistan to you know, help influence and bring up peace in a really good at use of soft power. Where was that going on? Didn't hear much about that, but we've already said that the Taliban have done an absolute blinder in terms of their info ops. So that's something we could have done in the long term, supported that through technology, um, through advice, um, rather than it being a simple training team, as you, know, you and I have done that kind of work, supporting the ANA or the AMP. Well, actually, there's other elements you could have supported um, in order for them to give them a better chance of, of, of countering um, that insurgency, though now reclassified as counterterrorism. if your name's Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah, you're right about the PSYOPs. I don't remember any of that going on, really, apart from uh, apart from direct, you know, to from agent handlers to informants and that, that kind of route. I don't remember any of the traditional sort of PSYOP stuff going on. Um, yeah, and I'm not telling tales outside of school because it got publicly recognised by getting the sword of peace. Yeah, for that work, that soft power work. Yeah, I mean recently, you know. Yeah, but yeah. recently, I just don't know. Perhaps it did happen, it just we're not privy to it. But certainly, in terms of that longer-term hope for Afghanistan, um, we had, there's been that enduring presence in South Korea, in Germany, um, but we just didn't want that approach in Afghanistan. It was it was, it was was just something we want, wanted to extract, well, say we, American-led, um, wanted to extract ourselves from as quick as possible, not have that enduring effect. But counterinsurgency is about the enduring campaign. Indeed, their campaign was called Operation Enduring Freedom. Not particularly enduring. Mm. I was reading, I've read, a, been reading a book recently, a friend gave me, Tony Shannon, and... Uh, we talked about Malaya, counterinsurgency yachts in Malaya and other it's called it's called uh Brush Fire Wars. Oh yeah, yeah, I have, yeah. Fucking brilliant book. Good. The bag there, brilliant book. Yeah. Learning so much. Um but in Malaya, we turned that round in like year, a matter of years. Counterinsurgency turned it completely around in the matter of years. And it, and <clears throat> it does make me wonder why it took us so, why it took us so long to not achieve much of an effect in Afghanistan. It, you know, compared to that. Again, Different cultures, different countries, different time, different military, different everything, right? But still, but still, when we go back to the psyops side of things, psyops is a, a key piece of counterinsurgency operations. And it doesn't seem that we, I hadn't realized until you mentioned it, it doesn't seem that we did it very effectively at all. At all. I wonder why that is. I think we did at the time, just the kind of, not really subsequently. Um, during when we were there, that activity was going on. Uh, but since the kind of drawdown, that's that's you know an important weapon, uh, you know, soft power, non kinetic, but something really positive that can can be done. And they, I, I I won't you know go into um, the, those parallels counter insurgency because previous guests have done. Phil definitely did a a better job of explaining that how we unlearn the lessons of Northern Ireland. You know my first tour, um, and I know you served there too to um, to Afghanistan, but we certainly forgot those lessons of, of counterinsurgency insurgency, all right, easier because of our yeah, cultural similarities. Um, it, it, it's part of the United Kingdom, Great Britain, Northern Ireland, so it was easier in order to operate. But then we've had complex environments like Malaya as well, but, but less successful. It took us a while to become successful in Afghanistan. Who do you see uh, becoming the most influential in Afghanistan, Russia or China? China. Said that quick, didn't I? Um, I just think that they're. I, I think the the proximity of the geography, and and their persistent aggression, um, at no cost economically, environmentally, and in terms of human cost, I think um, they and they've they've exhibited uh, evidence of that in in sub-Saharan Africa. And we've seen their their approach to um, their expansionist policies out there. Um, we've also seen the delegations of the Taliban um, with the uh, Chinese uh, foreign minister. So they've been working at this for, for a while now, and they've just been waiting for their opportunity. Um, so that will prove an interesting interesting dimension in terms of the geopolitical piece between China and Russia, about whether or not they then look at carving it up. Um, in terms of that expansionism or, or whether it's a China it's China's turn 
you know the great graveyard of empires well russia britain's had a we've you know, the great game that we've played out in in the uh 1800s and to today ha has failed so perhaps it's china's turn Mm. Interesting. Maybe interesting times. Do you know how many British nationals are left in the, in Afghan? There was a figure. I think there a, a thousand people. I think that were that have been left behind. Um, it's quite a few, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a sizable amount. Do you know what's going on with those guys and girls? Well, interestingly, I saw the narrative change on that. So the little nuances in language you have to look out for. So they spoke about how they had um, extracted the majority of single nationality Brits. So therefore, when you think about people with dual nationalities, <laughs> who are just as you know important and British as us, you know, it's, it's how they kind of counted the measure, measurement of success in, in that sense. So that's quite interesting. Um, how you read into that as you, as you want. But in terms of the plans going forward, it's all about getting them to uh, a third country. So going back to that little ship's digital exercise via WhatsApp, that government advice that, I've, that, that has been given, we've been able to share amongst the network. So if you are speaking to someone trying to get out the country that they've got the relevant information um, in order to, uh, if they do find themselves in a third party, to be able to get in contact with, with the consulate and, and extract themselves. Do we know of any uh, Western companies still operating there? There are, is a... Um, Overtly operating. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, I'm not sure about the bank. So... Uh, Standard Chartered Bank were, were actually a bank that operated, the only Western bank that operated in Afghanistan. It'd be interesting to see their activity because that, that would be a good indicator in terms of future intent um, economically around Afghanistan. You know, the market will be king on that. So it'd be interesting to see what business um, is doing that on that front. And where there is an opportunity, where there's war, there, there are people that make money out of war, um, privateers. So whether or not this is a market for private companies to, to step in and fill the void of government to get people out. Well, Eric Prince is already in there, right? Um, I think we've seen some activity. Um, it, was, it was in the news. Oh, right. Okay. Didn't read that. Yeah, he was. Um, so he seemed very informed. I think so he was charging six or eight grand a head for extraction. Wow. I think, wow. From okay. the airport. I think something like that it was. Okay. But but you can argue both sides of the coin there. It costs money to get it does. a plane in. Risk. It costs is risk. It costs money to pay security. So that might well be the cost per head, albeit with a, a heavy, heavy profit on top. Yeah. Um, knowing that guy. <laughs> Another really interesting piece of uh, open source intelligence is a uh, flight tracker as well because you can actually see what's going in and out of uh, the airheads. So uh, Mazar sharif um, in the north, which was uh, one of the last, it, it basically fell um, unhindered. Um, and it's the, the one of the, the I think, Tajik dominated um, populations in the north. There were flights going out of that um, after Kabul being taken by the Taliban. Oh, what's going on there then? You tell me. Um, but they were they were heading out and and heading towards the Middle East, so they were Afghan Airways uh -huh. um, chartered aircraft. Don't know the details of that, but that's from open source intelligence. Just by being inquisitive, go on Flight Tracker, uh, and you basically and uh, apart from when they turn things off as well for the military extract, understandably, but you saw some the the air operation unfold on Flight Tracker, which is very interesting. Mm. Or is it full of Chinese mineral miners? <laughs> 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 you never know. <laughs> well, they were leaving Afghanistan. Perhaps they arrived and then, it was, yeah, they just dropped them off. Um, I don't know. Um, but it's going to be... My, my, Hugh, the, the thing that I'm... At the moment, the media is not letting up on this. And I think Joe Biden is hoping that the this is just a new cycle and that and, you know, by the time the midterms come around, happy days. Uh, obviously, the government would will want this to settle down as well but i'm very proud of our media actually they do get a a hard time but the the amount of attention i've been i've done local radio interviews and i've seen that replicated from veterans on twitter 
um, this morning, I think I saw three or four veterans did a BBC piece. I did something with the BBC Radio Northampton this morning. So they are showing an interest in this, particularly around the um, uh, the refugee side of it, understandably, and that's rightly where our focus should be. So it would be really interesting to see how much, how long people care about this. People forgot about Afghanistan. Do you know what? I probably forgot about Afghanistan. I'd reconciled it years ago. I hadn't looked at any photos for years, apart from the odd one where you need it for like a promotional material piece. I hadn't flicked through the albums of, of Afghanistan. Um, I'd reconciled, I'd put it to bed. But what this has done is, for me personally, has literally got the fish tank and all that silt at the bottom has shaken it all up and it hasn't settled. I don't know where it's going to settle. I don't know what's in amongst that murk as well. Um, has a has a uh, a random piranha fish um, got in that tank? Don't know. Um, and but I think also for the British public, they they'd reconciled Afghanistan, and you know there was there's a folklore around it, uh, right or wrong, and there's definitely some questions that need to be asked. But then perhaps this has been the moment where it has forced the issue around the narrative around having an, a public inquiry into Afghanistan from the reasons going into the first place into the reasons we left uh, as well. I think those that's politically now um, the weight behind that. But in terms of us, 180,000 of us, okay, some of that might be duplication of effort as well, but serve in Afghanistan. Um, so for our generation, we're talking people in the 30s, 40s and 50s who have still got a lot to give to this country and to society and to business. I'm very fortunate I work within that veterans community in business and we've seen that through the Veterans Work Piece with Deloitte, the Officers Association of Forces and Mind Trust. Us espouse the values of veterans in business and that campaign still carries on and we keep need to keep banging the drum. But I'm obsessed with about public life and about making sure that, vis that veterans from our generation contribute back into that as well as i've hopefully built the, the case and i'm looking at you you know one day uh get, see you get get you elected <laughs> um but the, the but this is a generation that all of a sudden everything that we'd understood has come into question and and i've been very i'm, I'm very worried about the moral injury um, in the long term because we've all looked at those afghans in the eye and jokingly, but seriously meaning it, see you in the UK, mate. Um, or those children that I've helped in, in a school, though with that comes some hope that they're now adults and have a different view on the world from their parents. But those are very visceral images to me. And I know it's a classic avoidance technique of not looking at photos and things. And certainly some of the, the therapy I've been under through my trauma from, from my accident has, there's been moments of being able to confront those images, but they're certainly there in my mind. And there is a question about how we reconcile Afghanistan going forward. And I think there's, there needs to be some leadership. There needs to be, we're seeing the community come together around the, the refugee crisis, but I actually think it's time an Afghan Veterans Association and to be inspired by the generations that were before us so whether you look at the um, Korean veterans the Normandy veterans I think we do need some structure and we do need to regain the narrative of Afghanistan and when required if people need support being that single body of Afghan veterans to regain this narrative because that will then stay with us for the rest of our lives. Because at the moment, I just think we're a little bit lost. I feel a bit lost. And then as a side project of that, if the media do decide to forget about us, if whatever happens in Afghanistan throughout the rest of our lives happens, governments come and go. But if we have the constant thread of the Afghan Veterans Association, we can ensure that future generations understand what that conflict was about that we've had that debate, that we're able to pass on to future generations about Afghanistan, that if they are in a school with an Afghan child as well, that they'll have an understanding of, of why they're there in the first place. So we need to get into schools with this. It needs to be part of the curriculum. And I think there is now a space for the Afghan Veterans Association, and I'll be certainly making that case to the politicians that I know, um, to provide us with a centre of gravity 
around it. To be t- take some time to debate that, what the narrative means. Um, but for us to come together as a community and be. The purpose being what? I think the purpose is to give us a central centre of gravity. And going back to my fish tank ana- analogy, everyone's got their fish tank at the moment. Some people might not. I spoke to a friend the other day. He's like, you know, a very kinetic time working um, closely with um, Afghan special forces. And he was like, yeah, I'm fine with that. Um, kind of made my piece of it. But for a lot of a lot of people haven't. And I just think that what, and um, particularly going forward through life, it gives a constant thread that we can, you know, you can dip in, dip out. But having an association and a recognition by this country that Afghanistan happened because it would be all too easily forgotten. Just look at Northern Ireland. You know, maintaining that constant, um, po- the, and particularly the positive, as well as those, if people do come on, on hard times as well, that we have an association. It'll have a social element to it. Um, me, it w- and it will be symbolic as well. I th- we, we, we enjoy symbols. So it would be having a congregation of our association at the Cenotaph each year, whether it be having local branches, because I think we now need to look at what it means to be a veteran in communities. Royal British Legion is going through that, I think. Um, certainly I wouldn't, Royal British Legion branch wouldn't be for me. Um, and I just think that these are important these organizations to have that wrap around, give it some meaning, but also in terms of that narrative to discuss it, debate it, listen to Afghan veterans. And then what it will then prevent are just all of these kind of conspiracies and way out there opinions and spokespeople on Afghanistan. You might argue that I'm doing that myself today, but if we can ha- give it some meaning and, and uh, for it to be collaborative and collegiate, then going forward for the rest of our lives, it will just give us a bit of a handrail. And if you want to be participating in it and be like, you know, your local branch chairman of the Afghan Veterans Association, um, or, do you know what, not for me, but you might come back to it in the, and if you come to it in two years' time, then I think that's part of the legacy, a positive legacy we can leave behind us. Does it not step on the toes of the unit associations? No, they, they've existed. Um alongside in perfect harmony with other associations. So um, I think we need to be very clear about what it is, and that's about maintaining the legacy of that conflict and about providing education to young people about, about that period um, of, our, of, of conflict as well, as well as it being a membership organization that you have to have served in Afghanistan to be a member of, but then it will bridge any of the inter um, unit uh, association divides because the only qualification to be a member of is that you got that, you know, um, operational service medal Afghanistan or and the and the subsequent iter- and pre iterations of that in terms of optoral and op pitting etc. So, no, I think it could coalesce quite comfortably alongside other associations, but be relevant for our generation. Why wasn't there one for Iraq? Or why isn't there one for Iraq? Um. That I know there's one for the South Atlantic Medal Association, which is a, a real bit of credence. Uh, that didn't st- the South Atlantic Medal Association didn't start until 1997. It took them a while. And we've seen some of the issues around the legacy of the South Atlantic campaign. So I think we need to be more proactive. Maybe it's not now, time for now, because there's too much stuff going on. There's you know people's safety right in front of us at the moment. But I think in time there is room um, for us to be able to commemorate, honour um, our fallen as well from that that, cam- that campaign, to come together as a community and to continue the legacy and actually not let politicians shape that legacy, not let the media shape that les- legacy, not let whoever's in the White House shape that legacy, but us, the veterans of Afghanistan. Yeah, possibly. I'm undecided. I'm undecided. I'll win you I out. I don't know. <laughs> You're chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, your info ops. Yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah. How's your fish tank? It's all right, mate. It's all right. Uh, I wasn't sure what it was like at first, but now 
hate to say it, but I'm 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 nearing the opinion of what your well, your mate is like. Fuck, yeah, you know, we're at where we're at. <laughs> you know, let's let's look forward instead of looking back. Potentially, I'm I'm literally thinking out loud here uh, because. Um, well, when I say don't look back, uh, absolutely. Things like inquiries and that I agree with, but I mean in terms of um, trying to work out the morality of it all and you know its impact on you, your friends, colleagues, your family, flipping everything. You know, it's a dangerous game. It's such a complex thing to try and understand. I think it is possible to understand, and then you draw, and then you bring emotions into it, <laughs> and then it's like it's just crazy. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, there are absolutely people out there who are not finding it easy whatsoever. And then you get people who just uh, stir it up. Yeah. And they just make it even worse. And that's what I'm thinking about this. Uh, that's that's one of my arguments for the Afghan Veterans Association, that mitigation of, of those that are stirring it up. And there will be people that use this for their own gains too. Um, it's human nature. But I just think it will, that will be a, a safe place um, for all of that. Uh, to to occur um but it it was in terms of that kind of reflection i've done a couple of of um bits of radio and i did um gb news as well and i've never been on telly before and i hate doing it if i'm honest i'm always the guy behind the politicians you know briefing them lines to take going th- red teaming going through uh, mock interviews and now it's me and i absolutely i'm i'm great doing this cuz you know sat down with a mate <coughs> Um, but going on radio, dialing in, as I did this morning, and going down to London for TV. It's different, isn't it? Oh, I, I get, it makes me feel sick. But the thing, my, my I shared it with my family. And my younger brother, Anthony, said to me, he goes, do you know what, mate? I've learnt more, more about you in those, intervie- in those interviews. Um, than, and we're really close, you know, through motorcycling, you know, lads trip every, every year. Well, when I, when I used to be a motorcyclist. Um, every year we're really close, but it was, he'd learned something about me, which I was like, well, perhaps I haven't been talking enough. I don't know. And I wasn't like pouring my heart out about it. I was being really honest and, you know, and and slightly emotional, but I was being rational about it and just trying to come to terms with it and settle that mud, the silt at the bottom of my fish tank. But it was really striking that he should say that to me. Yeah, really striking, in fact. But good, in a good way. Yeah, good. At least he didn't say, oh my God, you're an absolute... You've you let the, the family down. <laughs> <laughs> you've let the family down, yeah, imagine yeah. that. You've let the family down, Johnny. <laughs> Mate, what have we not covered that you want to cover? We've done an hour, over an hour now. Um, what have we... Anything you want to bring up, cover that we haven't covered? Oh, here's a question. Why, why aren't there more... Why aren't more... Not that there's a lot of officers... Yeah, go into it, but why aren't there uh, a higher percentage of um, non-commissioned officers go into politics? Role models, pure and simple, and culture, and a, a sense of confidence. So, <coughs> two thirds of Parliament of those fifty MPs are officers, just one third. Um, but one of those has been a minister. Mike Penning was a guardsman. He was a minister for the armed forces at one stage. But I think I firmly believe it's confidence first and foremost, that, that you get through the, the officer cohort. Um, I mean, I've never been an officer. A lot of my mates are. I'm Bakshi Senior NCO. You mean confidence in operating, in, uh, in knowing politics, talking politics, understanding politics? I think so. Yeah, it's, it's part of their education. So when they go to Sandhurst, um, or, and it's not always the case these days, it's far more um, wide and diverse in terms of the schools they recruit from. They still do rec- recruit from either good schools or public schools or grammar schools that have that in their culture of of being worldly wise and confident and able to talk and communicate so and so that's going to continue all way through their life by and large and certainly reinforced through min- military service indeed johnny mercer i think talks about it you know he, di- he didn't go to university but he's certainly having that confidence uh, to be able to just put himself forward i think is a big thing and role models not enough role models are standing up and saying do you know what um, you know, I was, I was a Lance Corporal. Someone that's done that really well, Sarah Atherton, in um, in uh, in his, not in his month, um, in Wrexham, 
who um, was a uh, a junior NCO in the intelligence school, and she's unashamed. She's and she's absolutely smashing it out of the park in terms of uh, stuff she's done on the women's experience, for example, in the defence sub subcommittee most recently, and done some amazing work around that. So I think we need those role models to really push themselves forward, and that's what I try and do with the Veterans in Politics podcast to try and push those role models out there so and and the feedback i've had from people saying do you know what i heard sarah's story she really inspired me to as a woman junior nco like her i want to push myself forward now what do i do next so i think confidence and role models are really important and the more we tell their stories which is why this medium is so powerful because we're able to do that the more that people like sarah step forward and and do some actual good work then the more junior bods we'll get in um so i would say you know uh, don't rule yourself out but the same thing happens in business it's a similar story people will rule themselves out of applying for a job but you know that working in in the business world as soon as you cross that line no one gives a shit about you know what your rank was and all the rest of it it might be the source of some you know into unit banter and all the rest of it but in terms of the military network when i've worked with deloitte no one cares I regularly brief former brigadiers and former officers within Deloitte um, and with a mutual respect. So we, we need to learn some of that in terms of that messaging around going to business as well, because that still happens. People self-deselecting, but also in politics, people deselect themselves out of it on the basis of, oh, I wasn't an officer, etc. We will do it. Hmm. How do people, uh, how do people find out what you do campaign, uh, Campaign Force, etc. So, got a got a new website. Uh, just by well, the same URL, campaignforce.co.uk, and um, predominantly on at Campaign Force UK on social media handles. Got some new events coming up in the coming months to bring people on from that taster. So I'll be running a, another. I'd run two taster sessions, insight days. Again, learning the lessons from corporate world about introducing them to their industry. I'm introducing people to my world. And then we'll take people on that journey and offer up various stages along that that path to becoming a local councillor or becoming a member of parliament. All those mission-specific training. When we go into any mission, whether it be Afghanistan or or, or anything um, humanitarian, then we'll, we do mission-specific training. We need right training for public order. Right, we'll do that. Well, same deal with politics. There's certain skills that you need to get you to where you need to succeed. So for a model that we call... Um, select, elect, and perfect. We'll be bringing people through that journey on mission-specific training. Um, so it's it's a community that we're building up. It's about three hundred people on my mailing list now that's shown an interest. Uh, the podcast again is is generating um, a lot of interest too. So where can the, people find where can people find the podcast? It's called Veterans in Politics by Campaign Force. We're on all the um, wherever you get your podcast, and also have a YouTube channel too. Where I hope to expand sharing on some of those. Um, tips and advice to get people involved and is it on the website campaignforce.co.uk the link's there as well right? the podcast is I do have a podcast tab on my website as well um, or just look us up um, Apple is the most popular and Spotify as well perfect mate bit of pleasure Thanks absolute again. pleasure question though um, one last question oh god I think uh, sorry I keep asking you questions it's like god. the, the uh, young apprentice <laughs> Because first, first of all, I'd like to thank you for like the amazing um, uh, inspiration you've given me to to actually do my own podcast. But but also, um, you've I think I'm the third Johnny that you've had. You've had Johnny Mercer. You had um, Johnny Double Barrel Power Edge. Um, oh, uh, Mortimer Hendry. Yep, yeah. yeah. And me. The question I asked Johnny Mortimer Hendry. Um, <laughs> Am I the best looking Johnny that you've had on the Are HR you? podcast? <laughs> Do you want an honest answer? <laughs> Do you have to rank us? Like shag, marry, or avoid? Rank, rank you. No, shag, can you do shag, marry, or avoid for Johnny Mercer, Johnny Mortimer Hendry, and me? Shag, marry, or avoid? Do I, do I have to have a conversation with you after? Not necessarily. Shag, marry, or avoid? Who are you going to shag? What would you cook for breakfast? I would do a full Welsh. You get shagged. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Who'd you marry? Mercer. I'd marry Mercer, and I'd avoid Johnny Mitch because he probably wouldn't cook me breakfast. 
probably doesn't know how to use the microwave knowing him. Sorry, sorry, Johnny. Anyway, that's, that's a weird ending. Mate, it's been a pleasure. Bit of a weird bloke. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> that's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear, if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of Hey Chower have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I have a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to... A Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.